Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day that you have made and that you have seen fit to allow us to uh, join together uh, over this virtual church service. I pray, God, um, that you would be amongst us wherever we are. Uh, I want to remember God today. Or I want to pray about today what has happened in our country this week. Um, you instruct us in your word to pray for those who are in leadership over us. And um, this election uh, was just the so appropriate an election for the year that it happened in. It was, it was so 2020 uh, for the way that it is all played out. And God, we just pray that as, as the dust settles and as things start to become clear, uh, that you would allow your church to lead the way in showing love, grace, kindness, and unity as we start to move forward together as a nation. We pray, God, that your hand of blessing would be on this country, not so that we can be more prosperous or so that we can feel better about ourselves, but so that many hearts in this country would be turned to you. We thank you for the promise of your word, God, uh, in Daniel 4, that says you are over all kingdoms of the earth and you give them to whom you will. We rest on that and we stand on that today, God. And we ask that as your people, you would guide us to live out your gospel in this moment in history, in this place, in a way that brings much glory and much honor to you. To that end, God, I pray that you would speak to, through me now. I pray that you would give me your words. I pray that you would help me to make clear the truth uh, that is hidden in your scriptures. And I pray that we would not walk away from this moment unchanged, but that it would be an encounter with you. We need you, God. You are our source of life. And we thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Once again, uh, just really great to be back with you again today. I wanna say a special thank you to Jason, uh, who preached last week and did a wonderful job uh, teaching us out of Esther chapter six. And we are continuing uh, our fall series today in the book of Esther. Today we are on Esther chapter seven. So we are rounding third and heading for home, or maybe we're coming into third on this series. And we've called this series Hope in Trouble because even though it looks like hope is in trouble, there is reason for hope in the midst of trouble. That is both the message of the book of Esther and it is a word for us in the season that we find ourselves in here today in 2020. So with that, uh, let me read for us Esther chapter seven, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So uh, feel free to follow along in your Bible or to uh, read along with the words on the screen. Esther chapter seven, it says this, so the king and Haman went into feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who has, done, who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I recently had what has become for me an annual rite of passage 
Uh, you know when you move to a new place and you set up uh, internet or cable or phone or all of them, generally you get some kind of promotional rate that lasts for usually about 12 months. So we moved here in July two years ago. Uh, and so every August, I now get the privilege of calling our internet service provider because while our internet bill will run along at $50 a month or whatever it is, every August I get the bill and now it's like 80 or 75 or something like that. And I just kind of get this pit in my stomach because I'm like, oh, our promotion has run out. Now I've got to call them and try and sweet talk my way into continuing to get the rate that they had put me on. And so I just, just a couple months ago, I had this experience where I, I called our internet service provider and you know how it goes. You get that automated uh, computer voice on the other end and they're like, what can we help you with today? And I'm like, I want, a, I want to lower my bill. And they say, He's the, the computer guy says back to me, you want to know the status of your bill? I can help you with that today. And I'm like, no, I want to lower my bill. And he's like, you've lost your bill? I can help you with that today. And I'm like, no, I have my bill. I want to lower my bill. So then I do, I think what probably most of us do, and I just start hitting zero. Operator, operator, well, I, can I get some, some more information from you? And I'm like, no, operator, operator. And eventually you get to a human. And I say to this human, uh, look, I've been paying X amount for internet for the last 12 months and my, my bill has just gone up by like 50% and I would really like to figure out how I can just keep paying the same rate that I've been paying for the last year for the same service. And that turns into like a 25 minute back and forth and it's very predictable because it's like, well, you've been on a promotional rate, let me see what other promotions we have right now. And he'll come back with, if you added a home phone to your, to your service, we could get you a different rate. And I'm like, I don't want a phone. And he's like, well, if you add K, Cable, we've got a promotion for that. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want cable. And, and finally, I'm like, look, I don't want anything to change. I just want to keep paying the same rate I have been paying for the same service. And he goes, and I'm not kidding. He goes, so you don't want anything to change. You just want the same service at the same price. And I'm like, yes. And he goes, well, I don't have the authority to do that for you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We've been talking for 25 minutes. And he's like, well, this is customer service, Mr. Anderson. You need to talk to customer retention if you want to keep the same plan but pay a lower rate. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. The problem in that, in that story, the problem in that instance is, is I was talking to someone. I was trying to get something out of him that he literally could not give me. He was not able to give me what I wanted. I was, I was, as the saying goes, barking up the wrong tree. He couldn't give me what I needed. The title of my sermon today is A Matter of Life and Death. Because as we come to Esther chapter seven, we see a contrast between these two characters, Esther and Haman, whose, whose fates turn out very differently, but they are both asking the same question as we come to Esther chapter seven, and it is this, what must I do to live? Where, where do I find life? And you know who else was asking that question at that time? Only every single person on the face of the earth. And you know who's asking that question in our times? Only every single question on the, every single person on the face of the earth. What must I do to live? Where do I get life? Where do I find life? And I don't wanna, I don't wanna freak you out this morning because I'm gonna go a little bit existential. As the, as the cool kids would say, I'm gonna go a little bit meta. I am going to talk today about the core question of human existence, and that is where do we find life? And we're gonna try and sort it out in the next 25 minutes. So let's see how that works out. Let's see how that works out, works out for us. It is, it is every person, that has ever lived, every person that is alive today is asking themselves that same question. Where do I find life? Where do I get life? And why do I know that? Because I can say this, none of us, none of us wakes up in the morning and thinks to, the, to ourselves, you know what, I think I would like to have less life today. I think I'd like a, a little bit less life today. I think I'd like to be um, a little bit less happy. I'd like to be less content. I'd like to be less sure of who I am and why I'm here and what I'm doing with my life. I'd actually like to be a little bit sicker today. I would like to have less life. Nobody wakes up and says that. We all wake up and though we don't actually verbalize it, maybe some of us do, if our soul could speak out loud, as our eyes are opening up and we're moving from unconsciousness to consciousness in the morning, the longing of our soul, the longing of our hearts each day when we wake up is, I would like more life today. 
I would like to have more life. I would like to, I would like to feel healthier today. I would like to be more confident and more content and more sure of who I am and why I am here and what I am doing. But the problem, and this is a problem whether you call on the name of Jesus or whether you don't. The problem is that for the vast majority of us, vast majority, majority, sorry, for the vast majority of us, we're pretty miserable. We are, we are spending our existence moving through our time on this planet just with this, this gnawing sense of discontent and unhappiness and disappointment with our lives and the way that our lives are going. And the question I want to put before, before us is why? why? Why is that? And I'm going to answer my own question. My, I would submit to you that the reason we feel that way, the reason we feel so much discontentment and disappointment with our lives is because we are looking for life in the wrong places. We are looking for life in the wrong places. And how much has that been exacerbated this year? Those feelings of discontent and disappointment and frustration with life. And I wanna make the point today that we are, the reason we are struggling, a lot of us, is because we are looking for life in the wrong places. As we've worked through the book of Esther, I have tried with varying degrees of success to give each chapter a, a one word summary. And so as we get to Esther chapter seven, the one word summary I wanna give it, and you won't be surprised after that introduction, is it is life. This chapter is about life. I'd actually like to give it two words, life and death, uh, but death can kind of slot in underneath the heading of life. This chapter, Esther chapter seven, is answering the question very in no uncertain terms, who gets to live? Who gets life? And the reason I am so excited to preach this chapter this morning is because it is the gospel message in the Old Testament. And God in his gracious wisdom has communicated to us here, sliding it in, in Esther chapter seven, the good news of his gospel. We find two characters, Esther and Haman, two contrasting approaches to life, two contrasting uh, approaches to how do I get life and where do I find life? And the one who thinks he has life the one who thinks he has life in and of himself ends up in death. And the one who is condemned to death finds her life in the gracious favor of the all-powerful king. Only two points today. I hope that doesn't mess you up. It kind of messes me up. Uh, but two points in my message today. And the first one is this. The wages of sin is death. Or we look for life in all the wrong places. The wages of sin is death, or we look for life in all the wrong places. And I should have said before I gave the first point, if you're familiar with Romans chapter six, you will be familiar with my points today. Point number one, the wages of sin is death. And I just want to say, how is that for coming out of the gate strong? We are not easing into it. We're not warming up to it. We're hitting it. We're coming hard with a right hook right from the bell. The wages of sin is death. As we get to Esther chapter seven, we are coming to the climax of the book of Esther. We're coming to the, the height of the action. Esther is at the second feast on the next day with the king and Ahasuerus. And in this, in this moment, she reveals her true identity. She reveals that she is a Jew. And number one, how shocking would that have been to the king, but especially to Haman, who has set out an edict that he is going to destroy all the Jews, not realizing that the queen of the nation was a Jew. So he's probably like, wow, didn't see that one coming. She reveals that she's a Jew. She reveals there's a plot to destroy herself and all of her people. And she outs Haman as the one who is the mastermind behind that plot. And the king, in turn, sentences Haman to death. <clears throat> I want us, as we look at this chapter, uh, this is our last scene with Haman. And so I wanna take this moment to kind of look at the totality of his, of his role in this story. There is no question Haman is the embodiment of evil in this story. But I also think that Haman is a case study for us in this story. Haman is a case study for us in that he is a picture of what a life looks like that is built on all the wrong things. He is a picture of someone who is looking for their life in all the wrong places. He is talking to the customer service department, but he needs the customer retention department. 
he is looking to build his life. And if we think back to just two chapters, when he calls his wife and his friends together to recount to them all of the things that he needs to be honored for, he has built his life on his image. He's built his life on his reputation. He's built his life on his possessions and his wealth and his position in the kingdom. He's finding life in his, in his children and in his family. And, and we know that because the whole premise of this story is that he blows, he goes berserk when Mordecai won't bow to him at the gate because he has built his life on his image and his reputation. When Mordecai takes that away from him by not giving him the respect he believes he is due, he doesn't just brush it off. He, is, he literally acts as if Mordecai has taken his life away from him. And so in return, the only thing he can do is take Mordecai's life away from him. And in fact, Actually, what several commentators think is they actually make the argument that Haman was actually angling to become the king. So when, uh, when Esther says in chapter or in verse four, she says something weird about if we had just been sold as slaves, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. There are several commentators who say in that moment, she's indicting Haman for what he has done with the Jewish people in that he has stolen something from, something from the king. He has taken a people group that was under the king and taken them for them himself. And that is an act of showing that he actually wants to be the king. He's usurping him. And then again, in verse nine, when the eunuch Harbona says, to King Ahasuerus that Haman has prepared gallows for Mordecai. And he gives this little appositional phrase. He says, whose word saved the king. What he's saying there is, hey, Haman wants to kill Mordecai. King, you remember Mordecai. He's the one who saved your life by revealing a plot against your life. So if Haman wants to kill Mordecai, is there maybe a chance that he was part of that, that plot to kill your life? There is, Haman is not satisfied, nothing satisfies him. And so he just keeps needing more and more and more to feed his need for life. And his problem is that there is already a king and there is not room for another king in that kingdom. And that desire was his destruction. I do not believe that Haman's role in this story is to show us how, how brutal God is and how quick he is to eliminate and destroy people. I believe that Haman's role in this story is to serve as a warning for us that a life built on the wrong things, a life, a, a life that is looking for life in the wrong places ends up in destruction. Haman is a picture for us of sin. And God's word is clear that sin ends in death. The wages of sin is death. Augustine is one of the, the finest theologians in Christian history. He was one of the early church fathers and he wrote a bunch of books, but his, maybe his most well-known and kind of his greatest work was a book called Confessions. And in that book, one of the things that Augustine discusses is the very problem that I set out at the beginning of this sermon. He's, he seeks to talk about and explain from a biblical godly perspective, why are so many people unhappy? Why are so many people disappointed and frustrated with their life? And the way that he describes it is Augustine says that we all, all human beings are driven by love. We are all driven by love or by loves. And he says, our problem is that we have disordered loves. And in, in, uh, in today, today our, our times, Tim, Pastor Tim Keller has done a magnificent job of explaining this idea and, and building on it. But, but Augustine said, we have disordered loves. He says, we were built to love, but our problem is that we love lesser things like they're the important things. And we don't love the important things or the ultimate thing like it, we should. It, and it's his way of describing sin. It's Augustine calls sin disordered loves. He says, so for example, you may say that you love justice and equality and fairness, but he says, if in your business dealings, you exploit other people, what you are really showing is that you have a disordered love and you love yourself and your prosperity more than you love your neighbors. And Haman is a picture for us of what Augustine was talking about. He is a picture of disordered ordered loves. And if I can just gently, as gently as I can get up in our business this morning, we share the same problem. We all struggle with disordered loves. And actually, even as I say that, I'm like, struggle is maybe not strong enough of a word. We are all reeling. We are reeling from disordered loves. We are all looking for life in all the wrong places. We are looking for life everywhere except the place that we should. We look for life in our, in our, 
in our grades. We look for life in the college we get into. We look for life in the, in the job we get and in our, in our income and in the size of our bank account. We look to get life from our position. We look to get life from how people see us, um, from our image. We, we try and get life from how we, how we dress and what our body looks like. We, we try and get life from our family, from our kids. We try and get life from our spouse or from our girlfriend or from our boyfriend. We try and get life from our sports and our hobbies. But when we do that, we are talking to the customer service department and not the customer retention department because none of those things are able to give us life. They are disordered loves. None of those things is bad in and of themselves. But when we take those things, which are lesser things, and we make them the ultimate thing, we set ourselves up to be miserable because we are asking them to give us something that they were never designed to give. We cannot find life in those places. And what happens, what, it, what the Bible calls it is what Augustine calls it. It is sin. We are trying to become king of our own lives. And the problem is there's already a king and there's not enough room for another one. And we stink at being king of our own lives. And sin undealt with, sin un, untreated leads to death. The wages of sin is death. And I know that's not a popular thing to say. I know that's not like, hey, you're going to run and tell your friends, hey, you got to come listen to uh, what they're saying at ALCF because they're telling us that we're all sinful and sin leads to death. But it is a core tenant of the Christian faith. It is a core tenant of what we believe as Christians is that we are all suffering from sin. We are all suffering from disordered loves. And if that is not dealt with, that Haman is the picture for us, that it leads to death and destruction. The wages of sin is death, or we look for life in all the wrong places. Now on that encouraging note, the good news is there's a second point to the sermon and is this, the gift of God is life. The wages of sin is death but the gift of God is life, or we find our life in God. The gift of God is life, or we find our life in God. As we look back at the text, I want us to recognize that Haman is not the only character in this chapter. There is another one, and we know her. Her name is Esther, and just like Haman, she is asking the question, how do I live? And see, she is in a bad spot, because as she tells the king in verse four, she says, we have been sold. I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. So here's Haman who thinks he has his life in his own hands, who thinks he controls his own destiny. And here's the contrast in Esther who recognizes that she has no control over her life. She does not hold her destiny or her life in her own hands. Her life is held in someone else's hands. And so what does she do? And if you hear nothing else in this sermon today, this is what I want you to hear. Please don't miss it. She recognizes that she cannot give herself life. And so she goes to the king. She goes to the king and says, I need life and you are the one who can give it to me. Will you please give me life? And do you see how she approaches him? In verse three, she says, if I have found favor in your sight, and that is a word we've seen through this whole book. And do you remember what it is? It is grace. She recognizes that she, has, she is under a sentence of death. There is nothing she can do to give herself life. And so she goes to the all-powerful king who holds life and death in his hands. And she does not stand before him and say, here's why you should give me life. Here's my wealth and my prosperity and my position in the kingdom and the number of my sons. Do you remember that from Haman in two chapters ago in, in, in chapter five? She doesn't do that. She goes to the king and she throws himself at his throws herself at his feet and she says, I cannot live except that you let me live and there is nothing I can do to make you do it. I need your favor. I need your grace. Please grant me my life. Shh, the king is the one. The king is the one who can give her life and she recognizes it. And so she goes to the king and she asks for his mercy. She asks for his grace. She says, you are the source of life. I need life and you are the one who can give it to me. The gift of God, the gift of the king is life. Do you all know what I'm talking about if I, uh, if I say a bear trap? Do you, know what a, do you know what I'm talking about when I talk about a bear trap? Um, it's, uh, you know, it's those, 
it's a metal trap that looks like a mouth and it's got really sharp uh, teeth on either side and you open it up like this and uh, cover it with some leaves and if an animal steps in it, in the middle of it, that trap closes on their legs, severely injuring them and trapping them. Um, I don't know it personally, I'm a child of the suburbs. I'm, I'm not saying I know any first, have any firsthand experience uh, with bear traps, but I think most of us know what I'm talking about. Imagine with me for a moment that you're, you're hiking through the woods, you're walking through the woods and you come up upon a dog that has been caught in a bear trap. Now, for all of you dog lovers, this is completely hypothetical. Uh, this hasn't happened to me. I, I've never experienced this. I just, uh, this is a hypothetical illustration. But imagine you're hiking through the woods and you come up on a dog that's caught, it's got its leg caught in a bear trap. In that moment, that animal that is caught in that bear trap is under a sentence of death. If, if nothing happens, it is going to die. It, 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 its life is not its own, and not that it ever was, but in that moment, it, its life is not its own. And you actually, as a human, with opposable thumbs and theoretically the strength to open that bear trap, you have the power of life over that animal in that moment. And imagine that you go and approach that dog in, with, with only good intentions, intending to open up that trap and set that dog free. But that dog is so scared and so hurt and so confused. And, and when you approach it, it, it bears its teeth and growls at you. And as you get closer, it tries to lunge at you because it thinks it can set itself free. And so it's, it's gnawing at its leg and, and at the trap trying to set itself free. And you are the one who is able to set it free, but it won't let you because it thinks it can do it on its own. That is the picture of Haman in this story. And the contrast is Esther who is trapped and she graciously allows the one who can set her free to do it. And not only is it Haman or is it Esther, but it is you and me. Just like Esther, we are under a sentence of death. We have been sold, us and our people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. We are all in a bear trap. We are all in a bear trap of sin and no matter how hard we thrash, how much we pull it apart, no matter how many places we look to thinking they will give us life and free us from that bear trap, we cannot set ourselves free. We are constantly playing the if I just game. You know what I'm talking about? If I just, if I just had a different job, that would be life. If I, if I just had a spouse, if I just had a husband, that would be life. If I just had a wife, that would be life. If I just had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, that would be life. If I just had a different husband or a different wife or a different boyfriend or girlfriend, that would be life. If I just had kids, if I, if I just didn't have kids, that would be life. If I just didn't live in the Bay Area, if I just could see my friends more right now, if I just could be at church right now, if I just, if I just, if I just, but here's the problem, none of those things can give us life. None of those things are where we find our life. They are disordered loves and we spend so much time running after lesser things when there is one, there is one who can give us love. There is, excuse me, there is one who can give us life. We need to stop talking to the customer service department and we need to get to the customer retention department. So this is what I want you to, you to hear me say today. If you are unhappy, if you are disappointed, if you are frustrated with your life, go to the king. Go to the king because he is your life. Throw yourself at his feet and plead with him for mercy and grace because you have it already. You have found favor in his sight. Go to the king. He is your life. It is not our circumstances. It is not our circumstances that need to change for us to have life and have it abundantly. It is our posture. We must go to the king, the one who holds life and death in his hand and receive from him the only one who can give us life, the kind of life that we are looking for. And I want us to hear this in the season we sit in, in 2020, COVID, everything, economy, election. If, if nothing changes from here until the end of our lives, if this is the way life looks from, from here until it's over, I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen. I don't think it is. But if nothing were to change, we can still have life and have it abundantly because our life is not found in any of the things that are around us, in any of the things that have been taken away from us in this season, or in any of the things that we are longing for, hoping that they will give us life. Our life is found in one place and one place alone, and it is in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So go to him. Go to the King because he is where your life is found. 
I love, um, I love scholarly, um, clever, insightful, uh, deep exegetical sermons. I, I, I love studying God's word and I love sermons that really dig into the text and open it up. And, and there is a place for them. I'm not saying I preach those, but I love to hear them. Uh, I also think there is a place in preaching for reminding. I think a lot of times preaching just needs to be reminding because we need to be reminded who God is and what he has done for us. We forget, we forget, we know in our heads, but we forget in our hearts who God is and what he has done for us. And my hope is that this message today is a reminder. I hope that's what this has been. Look, Esther, Esther was supposed to die and Haman was supposed to live. But Esther lived and Haman died, hanging on a stake above the earth where everyone could see him. And friends, there is another one who died. There's another one who died hanging on a stake, raised above the earth where everyone could see him. And his name is Jesus. Jesus was supposed to live and we were supposed to die. But the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who literally is the author of life, who holds life and death in the palm of his hand, sent his one and only son to come and lose his life so that you and I could find our lives. And if we think about the title of this series, that is our hope in trouble. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot set ourselves free. We cannot find our own lives. It has to be given to us. And there is a good, gracious, and loving king who is longing to lavish his favor, to lavish his grace upon us, and to give us the life that we are so desperately looking for. Where is life found? It is in God. It is in God. It is in Jesus Christ, his son, and it is his and it is in his Holy Spirit. Go to the King. He is your life. I want to close the sermon uh, with the opening words of Augustine's book, Confessions, that book that he goes on to talk about the sickness and the sin of disordered loves. He gives us in his opening words a picture of an ordered love that is far better than anything I could ever come up with. This is how he starts Confessions. Great are you, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and of your wisdom there is no end. And man, being a part of your creation, desires to praise you. Man who bears about with him his mortality, the witness of his sin, even the witness that you resist the proud. Yet man, this part of your creation, desires to praise you. You move us to delight in praising you, for you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. He is our life. Let us run to him. God, I, I pray that you would impress this word on our hearts today. I pray that, that it would sink deep into not only our minds, but our souls and our spirits and our hearts. God, I, it is a message for me. I look so many other places to find my life. I, I, I look so many other places to find fulfillment and satisfaction and self-worth. And, and my loves are so disordered because you are the only place that I can find them. And so God, I, I wanna love you. I wanna love you in the way that is right. I want my disordered loves to become ordered and I can't do that on my own. I need you to do it for me. And I pray that for all of my friends who are listening, God, we can't do it on our own. We can't love you the way we need to unless you help us to do it. So reorder our loves, God, that we might put you first and primary and find our life in that. We ask that you would go with us this week, that we would be able to be lights for you wherever it is that you take us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace until we meet again or until our Savior comes and then forever. Amen. You are loved and you are prayed for and you are sent.